Without that lamp on, this room is too grey. Ah, it's uh, that light had so much warmth and I don't know why on earth I'm starting my video talking about the light when today's video is all about how I've switched my editing mainly from Lightroom to Photoshop. All right, let me, uh, let me crack on. I've got a, got a script here that I'll probably just need to go over again because I've completely lost my way. Right, all right, here we go. It wasn't too long ago that I was exclusively editing my images in Lightroom. Every now and again, I would dip into Photoshop to do some clone removal or, you know, do focus stacking, that kind of thing. But mainly, it was always Lightroom. And the truth is, it's because Photoshop for a long time has intimidated me. Um, you know, it, it just almost felt overwhelming when you talk about luminosity masking and all the different layers and smart objects and all of that stuff. And the truth is I'm still intimidated by it, but I do feel like I'm starting to tame the beast a little bit. So with that being said, I now find myself, specifically over the past three months, editing my images so much more in Photoshop than I do in Lightroom. But why is that? It all comes down to targeted editing and control. So let me give you an example. Here's a photograph that for years has been at peace with its Lightroom edit. But recently I re-edited the photograph using primarily Photoshop. And the reason I re-edited it is because for years now, for at least two years, I've been working on a book and I wanted to re-edit some of the images for that book. Um, and well, <laughs> since you ask, since you ask, uh, the book is uh, it's coming out soon uh, with well over 100 pages, 53 images with engrossing behind the scenes accounts of exactly what it took to capture that photograph. It will captivate you, it will educate you, and above all, <laughs> it will inspire you. But it's not ready yet. I'm still, I'm still choosing the paper, there's still more uh, editing to be done on the book. But if you are interested in my upcoming book, um, and you want to be, you know, on the news on the news list or the mailing list to hear about the pre-orders because that's how it's going to go out first. Um, go to my website, scroll to the bottom of any page, and sign up to my newsletter. But it's coming because all of my travel plans have been cancelled for the next couple of months. And whilst we're on the subject, uh, my sincere, uh, my sincere wishes and thoughts go out to everybody who's been affected by the madness that's going on in the world. Um, I know I've been affected, but I'm in a very lucky position for it not to hit me too hard personally. Whereas I know a lot of other people have been hit hard pretty bad and my sympathies really do go out to them. But anyway, enough about that. Let's just jump in to Photoshop. And I think I've titled this video Six Reasons or Six Something or Others because that seems to be the fashionable thing to do today. So six I'm going to show you six things in Photoshop that I've learned that really have helped transform my images and my hope is that you'll watch this video and you can apply some of those techniques to editing your images. I've got to put <laughs> got to put this on the desk otherwise there's too much echo. Okay, let's just crack on with the six reasons why I'm now using Photoshop more than Lightroom, some of which I've done for a long time, some of which are new, but let's just jump straight into it. So the first thing that I want to show you in Photoshop, which you can apply to a selection of your own images, doesn't work on all images, but some it works a treat. And that is the ability to add mood, mist and atmosphere. Now look at this photograph, this beautiful woodland. It was absolutely chucking it down. It was miserable, very moody, very atmospheric. And what I've been able to do using Photoshop and Lightroom, of course, is to emphasize that mist and mood whilst retain the fine details where it's important. Let me talk you through exactly what I mean. Now here is the raw file, the edited raw file. And you can see it's nice, but it's quite contrasty. I love the detail in all of these tree trunks, the prominent tree trunks, love that detail. But the background's a little bit messy, a bit chaotic. So how can we soften the background much like mist would do, whilst retain the detail in the tree trunks. Well, it's very, very easy. I'll show you exactly what I did. I duplicated this raw file, kept all the settings exactly the same, apart from one. The dehaze slider I brought to the left. And by doing that, you really soften the whole image. But the problem now 
is we've also softened the detail in the areas that are important. So what we do is we open those two identical images with the exception of the DHA slider and we open them as layers in Photoshop. Now we have two layers, one that's quite crispy and contrasty, one that's nice and soft and moody, but a little bit too soft. And it's a simple, simple case of adding a, uh, a layer mask and then just slowly brushing in the detail of the subjects in the image. In this case, it's the trees. And if we just, I'm just doing this for demonstration purposes, but you get the idea. Just bring in the detail there and then we can even increase the nice soft brush here and just on the foreground. And now what we've done is we have maintained a soft, moody, atmospheric background whilst retaining all of the detail in the trees and the ferns in the foreground. And that gives a nice, subtle, yet effective effect. <laughs> so the next thing I'm gonna show you in Photoshop is similar to the last thing in that it adds mood and atmosphere, softens your images, gives it an ethereal look. And I've been doing this for a long time and it's called the Orton effect. Um, and I'm sure most of you know it, but for those of you that don't, it gives a lovely soft painterly feel and it works particularly well with woodland images, but just don't overdo it, you know, just a smidgen. And I'll show you how I do mine here. It takes less than 30 seconds. One image in Photoshop. I'm just going to duplicate the layer and what I'm gonna do is apply a Gaussian blur or a Gaussian or a Gaussian. Uh, the blur is, I don't know, it's just so it's blurry enough that you can't see the detail, but you can still see the shape and form of the composition. So there we go, something similar to this. And then I'm gonna go to image, adjustment, levels, and I'm gonna bring this all the way over here, which is really, really gonna sort of boost those highlights, almost to the point where they're blown out. And then do the same with the shadows, bring that back. And that image looks terrible, looks awful. And then we bring the opacity down to zero and we're back to normal. Now the next thing to do is just to slowly bring in that layer by increasing the opacity. I usually work from anywhere between 8% and 15% and it just gives the image a bit of a nice pop, a bit of a glow. So here we go. This is it with the effect, without, with, without. And Photoshop is great for applying that effect and it works great across many different types of landscape photography, whether it's you know epic sunsets or intimate woodland shots like this. Moving on to the next tip, and actually the next three tips, I'm gonna demonstrate using this photograph. This is the same photograph that I showed earlier, which I re-edited for my book. Now, if you look at the Lightroom version here, this is pretty much the raw file. You can see actually by looking at the panel on the right-hand side, I've done nothing to it. All I've done is reduce the exposure by one third of a stop. The rest of the processing for this photograph has been done in Photoshop. So let's jump straight in. Okay, so I have uh, two words for you, two words which have terrified me for as long as I can remember. And only now am I getting my head around those two words, that phrase, it is luminosity masking. I know, I just, oh God, it's just so complicated, but I'm finally figuring it out and I'm by, I still haven't got it totally, but I've got it enough, I've got it enough to be able to use it on my images and really help em emphasize, uh, improve, I don't know, whatever, but let me show you, because the next tip, tip number three, is dodging and burning using luminosity masking. Now I am gonna put this straight out there, you know, this this is all because of Nick Page. He has some online tutorials which you can buy and they teach you all of this in great detail. I can't teach you this in great detail, not yet, but I'm gonna show you what I know. If you wanna learn more, go and see Nick. Okay, so how do I explain uh, luminosity masking? Because it's a very intimidating phrase. I know I was intimidated by it for a long time, but once you understand it on a basic level, it's very, very straightforward and it can have a really positive impact on your images, just like it has done for me. So let me try and explain it. Here we have my image of the lighthouse, right? I am gonna make a selection. I'm gonna select a rectangular portion of the sky, and that means that any changes I make to the image will only happen in this rectangular portion of the sky, just like so. 
Now what luminosity masking allows you to do is to create a selection not based on my hand drawing a rectangle, but based on the values of the image, the brightness, the darkness, the midtones, that kind of thing. Now how you do this is easy. You have a third party plugin called Lumenzia. This is what's gonna tell Photoshop to mask out those areas. So Lumenzia, the reason I use this is because everyone uses it, it's very popular, therefore there's a lot of resource online so it's easy to learn. But essentially, I've got my image here. It's a single layer, there's no, no multiple layers, nothing like that, it's as basic as you get. We've got a single layer here and we've got a bright portion of the sky where the rain is falling and I wanna darken that down and reveal a bit of the detail. So I wanna dodge and burn it, or in this instance, burn it. Is it burn, dodge, burn? Yeah, it's burn, I think. <laughs> so I wanna darken down this portion of the sky. Uh, now, uh, using the method that I just showed you, I could just, you know, try and mask off this area, but it's just gonna look awful. But instead, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to Lumenzia up here. It's a small panel and I'm gonna click one of these buttons. And what these buttons do is they will make a selection on your image based on brightness or darkness. So you've got L, L2, L3, L4, L5, and D, yada, yada, yada. The L stands for light, the D stands for dark, the M stands for mid. So if I click L2, for example, it creates a black and white image, except it's not a black and white image, it's a mask preview. And all this is, is it's telling me the areas that are selected are the bright areas, the, the white areas. So the white areas of the image are active, the black areas are inactive, which means if I paint over the black areas, nothing's gonna happen. If I paint over the white areas, then that is gonna change, and the gray areas, they'll change a little bit, depending on how gray they are, how dark or bright they are. So you can choose any number of um, mask previews, depending on you know your image. So in this instance, I only want to work on the rainfall. So I'm going to go for something that just selects the rain. Like this looks pretty good. You know, we have quite an obvious clear selection of the rain and a clear sort of separation from these houses and, and everything like that. So if I click dodge, that's essentially telling the software to create me a dodge and burn mask or, or a mask, or a layer like so. There we go. Now. It's still the image, nothing's happened. But what we have is a new layer, a new dodge and burn layer, whereby the only active area of the image is gonna be the brighter parts of the image. So I've got my paintbrush here and I've got uh, black selected. Now in theory, if I paint the clouds up top, nothing happens, no change. But if I paint the brighter parts where the rain's falling, it should in theory, darken down and reveal a bit more detail and a bit more color. And there we go. As simple as that. No other parts of the image are really being affected. So if we turn it on and off, we can see that we have darkened down that bright area of the image, quite simply, without spilling over the lines, going into the lighthouse and going into the houses. That is how simple it is, dead simple. And you can just, you know, let me do another one. Let me create another one. Let me choose a dark. What if I want to darken down the clouds a little bit? Well, I'll select a darks one, darks two. Remember the white areas are active within the image and I just want to darken down these clouds. Let's, let's go for this. There you go. I'm going to select dodge and burn. All right, dodge, Burn. Now I've selected the dark areas of the image and I want to darken them down further. So I've still got my black paintbrush and wow, okay, that's too much. That's too dark. Let me undo that and reduce the opacity of my paintbrush down to about 29%. And we're just gonna just go in, you know, just gentle, gentle, one bit at a time. And what that's doing is it's affecting the darkest areas of the clouds. And we can turn it on and off and see the difference there. It's not an obvious brush stroke. There's more to it than that. Um, so that's it. That, that's my tip number three, dodging and burning whew, using luminosity masking. Now let's go on to the next tip. 
So sticking with the Lumenzia panel and the whole dodge and burn thing, the next tip is to add color using the exact same technique. And in fact, it's so similar, I'm not even sure I can get away with this being an extra tip, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So tip number four, add in color. So everything we've just done with the dodging and burning, the brightening and the darkening of, cer darkening of certain areas, we can just do the exact same thing, but we can add hints of color. Now look at the detail in the cloud above the lighthouse here, it's fantastic. And you can see it's taken on a bit of a, a warmer tone, a bit of an earthy, browny, orangey, yellowy tint. Now what I wanna do is emphasize that and emphasize the shape. So I'm gonna create a mask based, or oh, well, try and isolate that texture in the cloud. Let's go here, lights one. And what I'm looking for is just separation. You can see here the black, none of that has been selected. So that's no good. Uh, medium too much has been selected. So I don't know, I'm just gonna stick with L, lights one, which is sort of masked off this area, which means the brighter parts will be affected more than the dark parts. Dodge, yes please, dodge and burn. All right, so now I can go in and I can paint in uh, these bits of cloud here that form the texture and the detail. Um, I've set my brush opacity to 40% because you know, we don't want to go overboard here. So I'm just going to paint in just around here, you know, just, just lifting this part of the sky and just trying to have an effect only on this really small area, but it's a very, very important area. The last two didn't work there. So that looks pretty cool. We can turn it on and off and see the difference that that's made, if, uh, that it's made. If you look at the clouds there, you can see that they are full of texture and detail and we're just lifting and emphasizing that. So I'm gonna delete this and I'm just gonna go ahead and do the exact same thing again. Lights one, dodge and burn, yes please, dodge and burn. So instead of painting on white, which will brighten that part of the sky. I still want to brighten it, but I just want to add a hint of color. So I'm just going to put in a little bit of yellow here, maybe. Just a, just a lovely bit of warm yellow. Just, maybe just, there we go. Just, just a hint, like creamy yellow. And the same thing again, opacity still set to 40. It's the same mask, everything's the same. I'm just going to go in and paint these areas here. Don't have to be too careful with it, you know? Let me just bring my opacity down as I work on a, you know, more specific areas that are harder to isolate. There we go. Now, let's look at that. We have really, really emphasized that, that drama in the clouds. Uh, we'll switch it on and off again. See, it's lifted it, it's brightened it, but we've added that touch of warmth, which is present in the uh, the highlights of the falling rain. So there we go. And you know, this works across a number of images. You can not only isolate and lift the highlights, you can also add a hint of color. That is, yeah, <laughs> again, a Nick Page special. He can explain this in his video course way more than I can. Um, but I'm just showing you the possibilities of this uh, luminosity masking. So the next tip, tip number five, is my favorite thing to do to my images in Photoshop. And if you've stuck with the video for this long, thank you. Uh, but tip number five, and the thing I like to do to my images is to add a wash or I suppose it's similar to LEDs flare. It's like, I like to call it like an ethereal wash. Um, let's, let's have a look. There's one applied to this image here. This is a photograph I took in my last video. So if you haven't seen that, I'll make sure I link to it in the description below. Uh, but go and watch that video. You can see me out on location taking those photographs. But let's break this down. Let's go into Photoshop here and have a look. So nice scene, lovely trees, lovely bit of side light. Um, hitting the trees, it's fantastic. And we can see in the top left of the screen here, we have quite a bright portion of the sky. And that's because the sun is just out of frame. And that sun is what's obviously illuminating the trees and, and making the image so dynamic. Now, here are my layers. Ignore all of these layers, they're just dodge and burn layers, just like I've showed you in my previous image of the lighthouse. The one layer we wanna be looking at here 
is the top layer. This is the wash. This is that glow. This is that ethereal glow to the image or the, the ethereal flare, we'll call it. Now I'm going to switch this off and you can see the original image. Okay, there we go. We've still got beautiful light on the right hand side, but the left side looks a bit unbalanced. It's a bit dark and we've got this bright highlight in the sky. Now what I can do is I can make use of this bright highlight. Uh, it looks a bit out of place, and as I said, it looks unbalanced. But what if that bright highlight was washing light down onto the scene, or more so onto my lens, um, creating a lens flare, which is exactly what we've done here. We've added that glow. It's very natural. It works well. The reason it works is because the image of the scene is side lit. The sun was there. And for all intents and purposes, there could have been lens flare on my lens, but I made sure there wasn't by positioning myself in the shade of the trees. So how did I do it? Very straightforward. And I love to do this on images on bright sunny days when the sun is just out of frame and it works really well. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and show you how I did it. Down here, there's a little sort of half black, half white circle thing in Photoshop. You click on that and it's a menu and you click gradient. Okay, now that's given me this weird kind of uh, gradient fill from top to bottom. What we want to do is instead of linear, we want radial. Okay, and that's going to give me a nice circle, circular gradient. Okay, and we can click on that gradient and we can just drag it around anywhere. And in this instance, I'm going to drag it to where the sun was. The sun was just out of frame. It was up here somewhere. So I'm going to drag it there. You'll also notice the gradient is yellow. By coincidence, it's the same color that I just painted the clouds above my lighthouse with. But that's what you want, a warm glow, a glow that reflects the color of the sun and that matches the light on the trees over here. So very simple. We have the gradient, we have the color, and now we're just going to increase the scale. We can also change the angle and just give it a, th a, a, a thinner wash, like a, a wider girth, I suppose. Um, and then we can increase the scale and we can still move it around a bit, just like that. So for this very fast and quick tutorial, uh, let's just say that that is pretty much complete. If you want to change the color, you can do that simply by clicking on the gradient clicking down here, and then you can change the color to anything. Obviously that's too much, it just looks like someone's urinated all over my image. Uh, so let's bring it back to something much more desaturated. All right, so there we have the uh, the wash, but it's too much, it's, it's too much. Everything's gotta be done, you know, subtly. So all we do quite simply is just reduce that opacity until it feels right, and we can see yeah, before and after, before and after, and it has quite a good effect. It doesn't work on every image, but it, when it does work, I feel it works really well. The one tip I would give you with anything like this is once you think you've done it, go away, have a cup of tea, come back and look at it again, because, you know, you sometimes you can get lost in your own image and and it's good to have a bit of a break and come back with fresh eyes. So that was tip number five, adding a nice wash to your images. And yeah, love it. What a great effect. Sorry, one more thing that I forgot to mention with this gradient fill. Have a play with your blend modes of that particular layer. At the minute it's on normal. I actually prefer mine to be on screen. It just gives it a slightly different wash, a slightly different look. So that is tip number five, adding a wash to your image. Now tip number, tip number six, and then the last tip, and probably the most important tip, yet also the, the simplest tip. Let me explain. So here we have an image. This image is from the same video as my last image from last week, so make sure you go and watch that if you haven't seen it already. A uh, nice, nice bit of colour in the sky, nice trees, nice bit of foreground. It is not the best image in the world, but it, it's fine. It's fine. It's pleasing. Now, one of the things that I always do with every single image, every single image, regardless of subject matter, I always do my edge patrol and the squint test. So edge patrol is where you check the edges of your frame for anything coming in and causing a distraction. The squint test 
uh, is where you kind of squint your eyes a little bit and you look at the image. And by doing that, things pop out at you, distractions pop out at you. Let me give you an example. Here's the image. This is the final edited version. Let's look at the not final edited version and look at the difference. Look at how many distractions there are in this image. You know, you've got all of these bits of snow and grass and this big heavy bit of grass over here. Let's look at the edited version. Look at that clean, smooth, peaceful, relaxing. Ah, oh, distraction, horrible. No, don't like it. And the, the sixth and final tip is Clone, remove, edge patrol, whatever. Let's bosh into Photoshop and have a look. Edit in Photoshop. Now the reason I love Photoshop for this is because you can be so precise when it comes to removing ob objects and distractions. Look at this bit of grass here cutting into my frame, causing the eye to go to the wrong part of the image. All I'm gonna do is select it, hit delete, and make sure that I've got content aware, fill, just bosh, done. That's it. It's simple and it works. And you know, it's content aware fill. What else is really good is the spot healing brush tool. I mean, look at this. I'm just going to go around. I'm just going to paint out these bits of all these annoying little bits. And yeah, you can go as well. Look at this. Oh, awful. Get rid of that. Get rid of that. Let's have a look around here. Don't like this guy. Don't like this guy. That's annoying. Yeah, so you, you get the gist. You can, the, the problem with this technique is that you can go in and you can become obsessed and you can just start removing every single pixel that you don't think should be there. But like everything you, in this video, it's you know, a bit of moderation doesn't go amiss. Um, but you know, cleaning up your image with clone removal in Photoshop, absolutely fantastic and will instantly improve a lot of images. Uh, so if you've stuck with the video for this long, Thank you so much. And if you're not a subscriber and you've stuck with the video for this long, you owe it to yourself to hit that subscribe button and become a subscriber. Um, right, I think I'm done. Um, I, I genuinely, I hope you've learned something and some of these tips you can apply to your own photography. And it's, it's a long learning process, but I'm thoroughly enjoying learning all of these new skills and I think you will too. So with that being said, thank you so much for watching. And until next time, Bye for now. Okay. So, for those of you that have stuck around until the true end, thank you. You are going to be rewarded. <laughs> well, not quite rewarded, but I would love to share something with you. Now, for those of you who don't know, um, in January, Myself, Adam Gibbs, Nick Page, Gavin Hardcastle and Greg Snell went on a one month long landscape photography road trip with the idea of making this kind of epic landscape photography course. But it was so much more than a course, it just turned into like this epic adventure, comedy, story, film you could call it. I don't know what you could call it, but it's huge. And I wanted to share with you a clip from that show it's nowhere near ready yet it's months and months and months and months away but it's slowly coming together and i'm really excited to share it so i wanted to drop a piece at the end of this video and what you're about to see is the four of us or i suppose the five of us in the deserts of california but what you don't know or what you won't know from watching this clip is that 10 days running up to this scene we'd been in the pacific northwest where it'd been raining every day rain 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 it was miserable we're stuck in this trailer this 1970s god awful trailer that leaks it leaks it wasn't weather sealed and after 10 days of hell we finally agreed we're going to go to california go to the desert and enjoy some sunshine. And when we arrived, it wasn't sunshine that we got. It was a blizzard Arctic conditions. And needless to say, I was not happy and I might have kicked off a little bit. But uh, yeah, enjoy the sequence and uh, thank you so much for watching. Oh, and if you wanna learn more about the road trip, go to eporoadtrip.com and sign up to the newsletter. Okay, I'm definitely gonna leave you now. Enjoy. <laughs> Oh, 
We were out of the rain, guys. I told you we wouldn't be in the rain every day. This is awesome. Yeah, this is beautiful, man. I love it. I said we were going to California. This is California. You said we were going to the desert. This is desert. This is desert. It's not, you promised no more rain, no, no more wind. Is it raining? No. Blue skies, sunny weather, warm I, weather. I didn't promise any of that stuff. I said it was going to be I beautiful. We could have gone to in Scotland. Norway! One hour to fly to Norway! Look at it! Just look at it! Just look at it! God, he always does this. I think he loves it. Yeah, but the tripod's really tasty yeah. though, isn't it? Oh, it's really nice cool. quality, yeah. I love how... I'm really sorry, guys. Um, I lost my temper. Are you going to go out and shoot with us yeah. then? Yeah, I mean, it, it is quite nice, isn't it? It's it unusual, is? right? Yeah. It is. Yeah. So I guess, I just, so I guess you were drive. wrong. Wait, we've been driving for like two days. Hang on, is this an apology, Tom? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, need, I just need to record this, just for posterity. Because <laughs> uh, this doesn't happen very often. Uh, continue. Um, should we go? Yeah, let's go. That sounds good. Well, that was a bit of a letdown. Houses. It's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs>